doing again the what we did yesterday, which we covered, I, I suppose, quite a bit of Psalm 16, defining joy, defining happiness as truly, in many ways, connected together, but the difference being earthly joy and heavenly eternal joy. And the thing about eternal joy is it can help us have an understanding of our direction and thus path of life. That eternal joy still might mean that we're walking on a path that brings us even through sorrow, as we saw in Lamentations. That even in sorrow, when it feels that our hope has perished and our joy has perished, remembering and recalling again that the faithfulness of the Lord is great and His mercies are new is a reason that we can have hope because our portion, our lot, our share is in Him. So we have reason to hope, and hope does not have to put us to shame. And so let us then consider our secure hope, how we can then go forward. If in Psalm 16, the very first words we read in our retreat began with the paths of life, how do we move on those paths of life? How do we travel on those paths? And we see here this picture running with endurance in Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. This is the word of the Lord. We talked about yesterday about um, hardships that, be- that come uninvited, right? The, the Jeremiah's loss of his home in Jerusalem, an uninvited hardship, right? One he never asked for and he ever desired to happen. But there's a curious thing that we as humans do as well. Tragedies come, we don't ask for that. But there are hardships and difficulties and tests that we willingly put ourselves through, that we elect to go through, that many of us pay great amount of money to go through extreme hardships. You know, some things might make sense to us, and other things you might look at and be like, why would any person ever do that? In running the Iron Man, that's going to happen in a few weeks here at Madison, every year, I mean, like, Some of those things sound fun. Swimming a little sounds fun. Running a little is fun to me. Biking a little sounds fun. But doing all those things at once for all of that distance, I don't understand why put your body through that much intense strain and pain and all the training, you know, straining your knees and your tendons and all of that. (laughs) Right? Maybe you don't have a good answer now. Maybe afterwards you will. Yeah, I'll chat after. (laughs) Why do people jump out of parachutes? Jump out of airplanes with a parachute, right? Why do people go skydiving? How about that one? I mean, you're not liberating France, so why do it? Maybe a little, you know, less, you know, physical exerting one. You know, I, you know, hear about how someone like an aspiring comedian, stand-up comedian, what they have to go through every night of their youth trying to carve out just five minutes uh, at, a, at a local comedy club to test out their material, getting no sleep for the night, not earning any money. Why spend so much time on money and education away from home, away from family to earn a degree, to get little sleep, high stress? Why do all these things? Well, if, you, if I mention anything that you yourself have enjoyed doing or maybe doing right now or training for right now, you have an answer. Maybe you feel picked on, but you're like, no, there's a reason for it. And the reason is because you know there's something on the other side of this. You're not doing it because you like how you feel in you know, mile marker 13 when you're like, oh, I don't, can I keep doing this? There's a hope of accomplishment, of, of achieving a dream. And that feeling of afterwards, this rest, this, God, I'd say godly pride of accomplishment of, hey, I got there. It happened. It's maybe even just a thrilling story you'll be able to tell about later. There are risks that we invite upon ourselves because we see a, a reward. We see an actual payoff for it afterwards. We are willing to suffer and to put it 
in a simple way. We're willing to suffer for joys. Again, these are the earthly joys and happiness. Again, I would not diminish because those are the, the, those feelings of accomplishment. I think that's also a feeling of joy. That feeling of utter exhaustion but having completed the race, like, that is a euphoric feeling. That's an amazing feeling. That feeling of, of graduation after very little sleep, after you know defending your thesis or finishing your last exam, you are completely a shell of a person. But man, you've done it. You've crossed the finish line. Those are earthly joys, those earthly moments of happiness that are so hard to describe. And for all that understanding, let us then look at what Hebrews says about what Jesus was willing to sacrifice for our joy. That he suffered for our joy so that he would secure our joy so that then we can strive towards that joy. He suffered for joy to secure our joy so then we must strive towards that joy. Let us look to Jesus who is the founder and perfecter of our faith. He suffered for joy because he is the founder and perfecter of our faith. And that's pretty much all we talked about yesterday. I don't want to I hit on Jesus, I, you know, spoke about Jesus a bit, a bit, and I got to the gospel a little because I always want to in every message. But I really wanted to wait to the fullness of it, of how Jesus really fulfills everything we talked about yesterday. We talked about the source of joy, how it comes from God's presence, why it's worth to hope for joy from God. So let's focus on the actual foundation, the underlying parts of our faith. Jesus is the founder, the beginning of our faith, the reason for our faith, the reason for our hope. We have, why you have reason to endure on this earth begins with what Jesus did. Because that means your salvation has nothing to do with your own endurance. Your salvation has nothing to do with how happy you were when God found you. It begins with Jesus' love and mercy for you. It begins with the love of Christ. It begins with Christ's mercy. It begins with Christ's perfect life and death for your sins. He is the first mover of your salvation, the genesis of your hope. But he doesn't just get the ball rolling and have you take over. Jesus is the finisher. Jesus is the perfecter of your faith ensuring that you reach the goal that is set before you. He doesn't just, you know, he isn't just the starting gun for the race, but he carries you and ensures that you will actually cross the finish line. He doesn't just choose you at the beginning for your happiness and joy. Neither do you perfect your faith by your happiness, by being the most happy Christian you can be. But your faith is perfected, and you find joy, and you find happiness by the perfect love of Jesus working in you the entire way, all the way to the end, beginning, middle, and end with Christ the entire way. That to be perfected is not simply talking about the end result, but how we get to that perfect end result. He brings you through the perfect process. He is at work in your faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that when we talk about looking ahead to a joy it is all for what Jesus suffers that we can be sure. And what did he do? He endured the cross. It says he endured the cross, the immense pain that that meant, the unbelievable amount of pain and suffering, of mock being mocked and whipped and beaten, suffocated by being nailed upon the cross, dying, all for what? The joy set before him, despising the shame, the dishonorable and cursed death of being hung on a tree, as Deuteronomy 21 says, cursed is any man who hangs on a tree. He bore the, craw he, the curse of sin that I bore and you bore. He received the shame of the cross. Not simply the pain, but also the shamefulness, the dishonor that he did not deserve, that was ours, that my shame and your shame and my dishonor and your dishonor, he took upon himself upon the cross so that you would be removed from you. Why would anyone endure pain and endure shame as well? 
Because all those things we talked about before, you know, skydiving or running the Ironman, accomplishing a degree, those are things to actually give you, like I said, pride. It doesn't, you get honor for it. Why would anyone endure pain for dishonor? Why would anyone endure pain for the sake of being, having their name shamed? In the uh, ending of the Arthur Miller play, The Crucible, which I'm sure many of you read in, in like high school English class. It's the story of the Salem witch trials and all these you know, people who are brought up on false charges of, of witchcraft in the Massachusetts colonies. And it ends here with John Proctor, the, one of the main characters of the show, uh, putting his name forward to be listed among those, to be able to try to somehow redeem, redeem others and to stand up against the, the horrible accusations that are being happened, but he realizes too late at the end by giving this confession to help bring some hope that his name will be written down and listed among all those condemned. And he pleads with them. He pleads with the magistrates, leave me my name, because I will not have another. That the worst thing that's happening to him is not simply that he's going to be hanged, but that his name will be disgraced. Is the most vital part of him. And it is at the cross that Jesus' own name, for that moment, for that brief moment, as he is mocked, mocked for being called the King of the Jews, that his name is brought into shame and dishonor. But why would he endure the shame and dishonor? For the joy that waits on the other side. Because he knows of the empty tomb that comes after. To erase all the shame and all the pain that on the other side of it is true, immortal, everlasting joy. And it is joy that's not just for himself, but that is secured for you as well. If you fear what it takes to endure for Jesus, for the suffering perhaps, and the shame that it, it means to endure for Jesus. He endured greater shame and greater pain, all for the joy set before him. And it is what he did in enduring that, that your, your joy then is secured. Our hope of joy is secured in Christ. It is guaranteed. Everything that we talked about yesterday is guaranteed for you and is secure and held safe and sound by what Jesus has done, all for what he endured. He endured when your endurance was gone. When Jeremiah says, my endurance has perished and so has my hope, if Jesus is your hope, he rose even from the dead so that your endurance can rise from the dead as well in Christ. You've been raised with Christ and so has your ability to endure because it is his endurance that endures in your place. When depression and despair were so great, Jesus did not despise the cross, but willingly went there because of his steadfast love that we talked about last night. It means there is certainty. This is not an investment that could be lost in a bad financial quarter or recession. It's not just something that, yeah, the interest rates look good right now, so I'll invest in this. This is already done and guaranteed. It's a treasure, a portion, an inheritance that is guarded, sealed, and reserved for you with your name etched into it that cannot be erased because Jesus has called you. He will surely do it. And why do we know he can make that call? How do we know that Jesus can guarantee that for you, can guarantee joy for you? Because he has the authority to do it. How do we know he has authority? Because what does the author of Hebrews say? Where is Jesus right now? Seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Seated over all creation. The heavens and the earth are under his feet. And he said before his ascension, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Think about yesterday morning again of Psalm 16, verse 11. God himself is the author of every blessed smile and moment of happiness that you have received. Because every pleasure comes from him. All pleasure in this life. And Jesus sits with that same authority. 
If God himself is the creator of all the blessedness in your life, Jesus himself is God, and so from his hand comes all blessing. And remember again, where, does, where do pleasures forevermore come? In Psalm 1611. Where do we look to for pleasures forevermore? At your right hand, God. Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father. What are the pleasures forevermore? It's kind of a vague term. The pleasures forevermore that are at God the Father's right hand. Your pleasure forevermore is Jesus. He is your portion. He is your joy. He is your hope because he is at God's right hand. It's not what blessings and wealth that are in God's hand, but who is seated there with all authority to guarantee your joy. When you encounter pleasures forevermore, look to the right hand of the Father in heaven, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the source of your new mercies that you find every day. Jesus is the source of your endurance. Jesus himself is your hope. That when it seems that mercy and endurance and hope and faith have perished, you look to God's right hand and see the imperishable one that could not be kept down by death itself. So if you look to God's right hand for joy, for pleasure, for hope, you see someone who is incorruptible, who cannot be held down by the grave. So if you fear hope being dried up, if you fear joy fading or happiness fading, look to one who cannot die, who cannot fade, who cannot wrinkle or welt. Jesus, the immortal Son of God, seated at the right hand of God. That is why we have hope. That is what it means to have joy, to look to the source Because it's sure. It's not going anywhere. It's immovable and undying. And so, how do you endure in this life? When happiness seems to flee, when your endurance seems to struggle, this is what it means to strive towards joy because you are going towards something that's incorruptible. Even when your strength doesn't seem to be enough, you're forgetting that you're not relying on your own strength. Because again, your faith is not perfected by your endurance. Your faith is not perfected by how happy and how well you can smile on a Sunday morning. Your faith is not by sheer willpower, but by the founder and perfecter of your faith. So he said, let's put aside every weight and sin that hinders us. Everything that clings so closely and weighs you down. You, th- you see some people training for running, for, for marathons, and they wear these you know, weighted vests kind of build better core strength and build better endurance. You know, those people aren't actually going to be wearing those when it comes time for the actual race. You're not going to see track stars still wearing the weighted vests when it comes time for the hurdles. That wouldn't, that wouldn't do good. You wear it so your body then feels lighter. So you cast that off in time. In the same way, our sin is the very thing that hinders us from joy. When we are feeling great, time, I'm, great times of struggling in joy, it is a result of sin that is around us and sometimes sin that is in us. I'm not saying any unhappiness is a result of some unconfessed sin that you need to find. But it is a great opportunity to examine the brokenness of this world and possibly the brokenness of your sin as well. Look inwardly as well as outwardly. Sometimes our hope vanishes because sin's done to us. And sometimes we're experiencing, just like the people in Jerusalem and in Lamentations, we're experiencing bad things also for the consequences of their sin as well. So we should look closely at what is clinging closely to us and hindering us. Be circumspect. But does that just bring further shame on you? Jesus endured the shame of your sin. So if you're still holding on to sin that is clinging to you, look to God's right hand. Jesus, who bears the wounds of the cross. And no, those sins that are clinging closely to you were already placed on him. They do not need to cling to you anymore. 
And you cannot cast them off again by your willpower, but by what Jesus has done, looking to him as the founder and perfecter of your faith. That is how you're going to be able to run, is by confessing that your sins have been dealt with on the cross. Because otherwise, when we run holding on to sin, We're running with it on our shoulders, pushing us down, harder to pick our feet up, with our our chest down inward, shoulders bent in, feet, eyes to our feet and to the ground. It's hard to run when you're looking at the pavement. It's hard to run when your back is down. You're going to run faster with your chest proud and your eyes to the horizon. You can run so much faster that way. We can only do that if our eyes are fixed on Christ. So let us run enduringly. Because the gospel means that you're running the race by the power of an accomplished marathoner. The gospel means that Jesus has endured all of this for the joy set before him. And so you are sure you will be able to endure to the end. So what you do now you may experience similar to what the runner's high is. For those of you who have really made running a a great hobby and enjoyment, there's that feeling at a certain point, even in the run, after the run as well, but even during it, we're like, I feel great. I just feel better. The endorphins kicking in and just uh, giving you actual, like, runner's joy. Because enduring and accomplishing Your brain is telling you, this is a good thing. I'm enjoying this. That's why people run and run and run and do Boston Marathon many times and want to go to the other cities as well and run all those marathons because it's something that they just feel that joy in doing. Understand that running with endurance with our eyes fixed on Christ does bring itself joy. It's hard to describe when that happens. Is it every step of the journey? There are certain bends in the road when the road then all afterwards straightens out before you and walking with Christ that you see again the reason for your joy. So that there can actually be joy in challenges. As James says, consider all joy, brothers, when you encounter trials. I think it makes all the more sense then. For any of you who enjoy then any you know, exertion of physical activity, the, re- the runner then, who gets, you know, that feeling of runner's high is not getting the runner's high because they're short of breath. But they feel joy and happiness when they look down at their watch and know they're going to beat their time. That brings a sense of accomplishment and joy. Between those haggard gasps for air, the runner then smiles. The basketball player doesn't feel euphoria when they've got their when they're on their ha- their hands on their knees, hunched over after a full court press. That isn't what makes the basketball player happy. But they have a cocky smile on their face in those five seconds after they've gone up and blocked a shot at the basket. So it's the achievement of, of knowing why we're doing this that brings that joy. Knowing the unrelenting defense they're putting out there is going to seal the victory for the team. It's more than just enduring. It's more than just surviving. It's what you're enduring for and surviving for. Enduring. Enduring itself. If we're just thinking about just enduring for the sake of endurance, it's not joyful. Enduring just for the sake of endurance is, you know, still playing the game when you're already beat, but you're trying to be a good sport. Enduring is knowing you have to run the annual mile in gym class. Knowing that, hey, at least I'll be done for a year and I'll never have to do it again in this year. Enduring in joy knows that the pain is still part of the process of getting closer to joy. Enduring in joy has your eyes fixed on a prize, actually. That the strain will be worth it at the end. That in the end, all the pain of having to endure will have been worth it. That there is joy in straining towards our goal. That it is by the Holy Spirit that for those moments, we can get a glimpse of the light of our joy shining through the clouds. Just as Jesus was able to endure the cross for the sake of joy, so we also get glimpses of that heavenly joy by the endurance that is ours by the Holy Spirit. So, by way of applying all this for us then, I want you... You know, now on your way home, 
consider the kill joys of your life. The, you know, Debbie Downers in your life. Not Deborah, she's not a downer, she's great. <laughs> what ruins a great day for you? Right? Word from the boss that you need to do the work all over again. A message, an email that you know is going to take just way too long to respond to and you don't even know where to begin. The news headline that pulls you back into the despair of the brokenness and horribleness of this own world and makes you question of your endurance. My advice to you is not just, hey, put a smile on through the tears. Not just fake it till you make it. Because there will be tears. There will still be frustration. There will still be those moments of gritting your teeth trying to catch your breath. But the knowledge is this race is not forever. This race has an end point. That being with Jesus doesn't mean you're running a race forever. The race ends, but the joy is forever. That's the difference. That there is a release from all those things that are killing your joy. That those pains have a fixed time on them. The time for evil is running out. And you are straining towards the joy in Christ. When I was a child in school... I was looking forward always to when school was done. You know, feverishly watching the calendar, watching the clock, staring at the belt, almost just willing the second hand to move faster, move forward. Just get me a little bit closer to 3.15 so I can hear that final bell, that feeling of joy, of release. And the same thing day to day. It's Thursday, we're almost at Friday. We're in May, that feeling of so close to June and the end of the school year. Now, longing, you know, willing the seconds to go faster, uh, didn't increase some sort of theoretical relativity that actually made time change. That's not how it worked. Actually, time moved the same speed at 8.30 Monday morning as it, in September as it does at 2.30 on Thursday in May. Time moves the same. But there's something different for me in those moments. Knowing that freedom of release from school is that much closer, right? That perspective made those moments of 2.30 on a Friday in May just a little bit more joyful. Know this. If you've put your faith in Jesus, the next time you face one of those killjoys, which will come, remind yourself. What time is it? When you look at the killjoys in your life, tell yourself the time. It's 3 o'clock on a Friday in June. There's time left. There's still more work to be done. There's still more endurance to have. But it's 15 minutes to the end. You're almost there. And nothing can stop that release. It's sure. The time of waiting, indeed, is starting to wind down. And you can only experience that kind of joy by straining towards that prize. You are, instead, you are speeding downhill. The waves are carrying you toward the shore. The wind is pushing you forward. Your body is still at its limit, yes. But the spirit, like gravity, like water, like air, bringing you towards your portion of joy, your share that is secured by the work of Christ. So as you head home soon, as you begin your work week tomorrow, there are going to be so many things that will test your endurance, that will feel like it dries it up, kill your joy. And I invite you all in those moments to analyze where your joy is truly found. What are those things that are killing your mood? Some of those things might be your attitude and your perspective on them that are bringing you down. But instead, cast your mind to the vault the reserve of your joy that's locked in heaven for you cannot be degraded by anything that you are having to endure in that moment. It cannot be harmed. And I believe that will bring you no small amount of happiness. Praise God that Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. Even when you feel helpless and hapless, praise God for the pleasures and joys at his right hand. So I do hope and I pray that when you get home and unpack your things, that you find some true rest today. Taking that eternal point of view, that big picture point of view of where you're heading. You're safe, you're secure, in the faithful, never-ending love of Jesus Christ. Because at his presence, there is joy unending. Let's pray.